Good afternoon, everyone. It is Wednesday, December the 25th, 2019. It is currently 3.30 p.m. Central Time. And let me begin by saying Merry Christmas to everyone. Yes, it is Christmas Day 2019, December the 25th. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know where you may be listening to to me, but for me, um, it is Christmas Day here in West Texas and currently outside. In fact, if I look out my window that's right here to my right, I lift up the blinds. It is sunny. It is 74 degrees. There's not a cloud in the sky. It's a Texas Christmas is what it is. Now, for those of you who live in some winter abomination of human existence, where there is cold, snow, ice, blizzard, horrible existence, I I apologize that you live in such a horrible place. I pray that one day you can be delivered from such a place and find your place, uh, find a, a place that's much better than that. Okay. So, um, that would be um, that's that would be the uh, the way to go is to escape the winter uh, abomination. I, I like to call it the winter abomination. I, I lived in Nebraska for ten years, and our first winter there, my first winter in Nebraska after growing up and being raised here in Texas, it was awesome. I remember the first time it started snowing, I was like, "This is amazing!" And I remember I ran outside and like, "Look at this! This is awesome!" And then I think about 24 to 48 hours later, I was like, why me? Why? What have I done? Why have thou forsaken me? And I I didn't understand what had happened. No, it, it it was nice for just a little while, but it got so cold and just the snow was... I mean, it's nice when it's falling, when this, like when the winter storm would come in, it would first start falling and you're inside nice and warm, maybe listening to some music, looking outside, you're like, oh, beautiful. But then the minute you had to to leave your, your dwelling place to enter into that winter world, it wasn't so nice. And then after a while, it would just, all the snow... It looked nice when it was falling, but then it would just there and get dirty and you're trying to drive in it and it's just miserable. So, no, I am glad that I'm in a place where it is currently 74 degrees on December the 25th, 2019. And if you happen to live in a a winter abomination, repent (laughs) and turn from your wicked ways and flee to a warmer climate. Now, obviously we need some people to live in colder climates because there would be too many people then living in warmer climates. So, so I, I, I'm sorry that you're there. Um, thank you, I guess, for, for being there so that we have more room here. I, I, that sounds kind of selfish and I don't know if that's very good to say, but it is Christmas. All right. It is Christmas. Where do I begin for our discussion on this Christmas day? How how do I how do I talk about this? Well, let's let's start let's start by considering Christmas. Now, l- l- let me let me kind of offer let me kind of offer the my idea, kind of my thesis for this episode of the Theology Central uh, podcast. This is a live broadcast. If you happen to be listening to us live, let me kind of kind of give you what what I'm thinking, and I'm going to use some different illustrations to try to show you what I'm talking about, if that makes sense. Within Christianity, we have a long history, especially within the Protestant evangelical form of Christianity, we have a long history within Christianity of trying to use worldly and fleshly things to promote and try to share the gospel. We have tried to use worldly and fleshly techniques, ideas, and gimmicks in order to reach the world, in order to try to tell people about Jesus. We have adopted every kind of fleshly, worldly, gimmicky, cheesy idea that we can come up with to try to reach people. Now, some people say by any means necessary, use it, use it. If we can use it and we can win one, it is worth it. Others go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We cheapen the gospel. We are not called to use gimmicky, cheesy, worldly, fleshly, 
you know, ideas, techniques, and methods to try to reach people. We are told to simply proclaim the truth of the gospel to people. That's what we're called to do. The church is called to equip saints, not to entertain them. The church is called to enter to equip saints, not to entertain, you know, those who are not Christians. The church is called to feed sheep, not to entertain goats. This is a, this is a, there's a, there's a divide within Christianity. One, they want to use any technique and they say they do so because they love, they love the lost and they want to win the lost. And so they're willing to use anything and do anything. And others are like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are, we are not called to compromise. We are not called to cheapen the gospel. We are not called to use worldly means to, to try to accomplish spiritual things. Um, there is, there is a divide here. And so I'm, my thesis here is to look at what the church does, and I am opposed to what the church does in using these fleshly ideas. I'm opposed to it, and throughout church history, there have been many who have been opposed to it. Now, we'll start, so that's kind of my thesis. Now, what I'm going to do as I'm going to start how this topic came to my mind today, and we're going to circle back around to the fact that it's Christmas. It's December the 25th, right? Um, and because Christmas falls into kind of a part of this, this problem that I see within the church at large. So, so let's explain how this all occurred today. If you're paying any attention today, all day, starting at, I think, at 11 a.m. Central Time, going all the way to beginning, I think all the way till probably midnight tonight, from like 11 a.m. to probably close to midnight. It's one NBA basketball game after another NBA basketball game after another NBA basketball game. Right now, uh, Milwaukee Bucks are playing uh, the Philadelphia 76ers. It's uh, it's in the fourth quarter, four minutes left to go. That that game's on, and I don't know what game comes on after that. I think the Lakers play tonight. I don't know what the late, uh, the, the late game is. Um, maybe Golden State. I don't know. Uh, so just basketball all day. Basketball all day on Christmas Day. It's kind of a, it's been a tradition, I don't know for how many years, but it's it's been a big deal. On Christmas Day, there's basketball to be played, all right? So you, you can turn it on and turn down the volume or have the volume kind of loud and then, or, you know, up just a little bit in the family. Everybody can be doing their things and then look over at the television. Um, you know, it's basketball games. You don't have to worry about offending anybody. You don't have to worry about making anyone mad. Um, it's just basketball. Now, some people may not like it, but they don't have to really pay any attention to it. So maybe maybe that's why the NBA decided to do so. Um, but, it, you know, it obviously, if, if, it, if people weren't watching, they wouldn't still be doing it. If the arenas weren't packed, they still wouldn't be holding games. So clearly, it's a successful thing for them. All right. That's the context. I wasn't really watching. I just had the game on, kind of like what... You know, other things were going on in the house today. I just had the game on, was watch, walking by here or there, seeing it, wasn't really paying close attention. And all of a sudden I walked by and they had the camera kind of shown on one of the team's benches. Like, you know, there's all the players there, you know, sitting there. And behind them to the right, there was this couple, guy and a girl. I think they were both wearing those little red, like, quote unquote, you know, Santa Claus hats, uh, elf hats. I don't know what they're called. Um, wearing those little hats. So they're in the, you know, the Christmas spirit. It's Christmas Day. They're right there to see a basketball game. And what stood out to me wasn't just, you know, well, there's just two people sitting there. There are lots of people in the stands wearing the same kind of hats and lots of couples together. So there was nothing unique about that. But what stood out to me was the shirt the guy was wearing. It was bright orange, bright orange. And when I first looked, I'm like, he's wearing a Reese's peanut butter cup shirt. He's wearing a Reese's peanut butter cup shirt. Okay, well, you know, Everyone's got their things that they love. Everything's got the things that they like. More power to him. He wants to be out there promoting his love for Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. Good for him, you know. Everyone's got to have that thing that they care about. And I got ready to turn my head. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. That doesn't say Reese's. That, that says Jesus. And I'm like, what? And, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Not one of those shirts. I've seen them a couple of places. If you've never seen them, let me describe it. It's a bright orange Yellow writing, it says Jesus. Now, of course, when you look at it, it's supposed to look like a Reese's peanut butter cup. Re instead of saying Reese's, it says Jesus, sweet savior, king of kings. Jesus, Jesus is written to look like, you know, in the same writing, the same style as Reese's would be written. And then underneath it, sweet savior, savior, savior 
king of kings. And I don't have a Reese's peanut butter cup in front of me to go exactly what their, how their package reads, but this is to copy the package of a Reese's peanut butter cup. But instead of being Reese's, it's Jesus, sweet savior, king of kings. Now, when I saw that, I just kind of shook my head and I got ready to walk off and then I stopped. And I started thinking, I wonder, for all the people who aren't Christians, don't go to church, don't really care about Christianity, they're watching TV today and the camera and where the person was sitting, I mean, the shirt was right there. I mean, people are going to see it. When they saw the shirt, I wonder what reactions were. I wonder if people just ignored it or if someone was like, Wait, what? I have a feeling, and I could be wrong here, but I have a feeling that the majority of people who are not Christians, the majority of people who don't have any, any you know, care for Christianity, when they saw that shirt, I, I have a feeling that what they did is started shaking their head, started laughing, started mocking, saying things about how dumb, how foolish, how stupid, how cheesy, how moronic, and probably using terms and words that I cannot say. They probably saw it as just a cheap ripoff. They're like, wait, wait, you're going to promote your Jesus by borrowing from a Reese's peanut butter cup? Come on, how original. Why don't you come up with something else? They probably shook their head. I doubt that there were a lot of lost people who saw that shirt going, you know what? I do need Jesus. I do need Jesus. He, I do need a sweet savior. You know, I do need a king of kings. That shirt spoke to me. I, I doubt that that happened. Now, you have to, on one hand, now I want to be fair here, we have to apply. That individual wearing that shirt, I don't know if he's given this any thought. I doubt he's ever even considered this. But he was probably, he was going out in public and probably, obviously, it's, it's Christmas, the day that Christians say we celebrate the birth of Christ. We'll get into that in a few minutes. Um, he probably thought, I want to go out, I want to represent Jesus. Jesus, you know, is, is my savior. You know, I believe in Jesus. I've given my life to Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus and I want to represent Jesus. I want to point people to Jesus on this Christmas day. I'm going to be sitting there right behind, you know, uh, one of the teams. I'll probably be on camera. I want people to see this shirt. I want them to think about Jesus on December the 25th. On one hand, you have to applaud. He probably had nothing but good intentions. He probably thought that he was trying to do a good thing and he was trying to witness, um, you know, for his faith. He was trying to be a witness for Jesus, a witness of Christianity. And so you have to applaud that he was probably trying to do the good, a good thing. I don't in any one way, shape, or form want to, to say that he wasn't. However, It is very possible to try to do a good thing, but to do it in a very, 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 very wrong way. There is is always attempts that the church, the church throughout church history has tried to do a lot of things, and we haven't always tried to do that. We haven't always accomplished them in a good way. We haven't always done them in the right way. Sometimes we've tried to do good things, but we have adopted wrong methods. We have used wrong ideas. And we have to be willing to think about what we do from a theological perspective. From my perspective, the Reese's, Reese's Jesus shirt is just horrible. It, it, to me, it cheapens Jesus. Jesus is not a Reese's peanut butter cup. I don't want to liken Jesus unto a Reese's peanut butter cup. He's the eternal son of God who took upon human flesh, bo- bo- conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried, raised, was, rose the third day, and uh, ascended to the right hand of the Father from which he will come to judge the living and the dead. Yes, I'm borrowing from the Apostles' Creed there. Basic Christianity, Christianity 101. Jesus is not to be likened unto a Reese's peanut butter cup that is fleshly, worldly, and almost borderline blasphemous. Who comes up with the idea that, hey, the way we're going to reach the world is to liken Jesus unto a Reese's peanut butter cup. Let's use that. Everyone's familiar with that. It'll get them to look at the shirt. Now, again, the motivation may be good, but you've got to stop and think about this. Now, I'm going to offer a little history here. When I became a Christian as a teenager, teenager, now, I, I was, uh, God saved me. I was in an, uh, a Southern Baptist church here in West Texas. 
a church that knew very little of doctrine, theology. I don't never heard a church history lesson, had no clue about the history of Christianity, was clueless about the history of, of Christianity, was clueless about systematic theology, biblical theology, any kind of theology. I couldn't have explained the Trinity to you. I couldn't explain anything to you, but I had a million questions and I definitely was not getting them um, from that church. So uh, there was a large portion of my Christian life where I was theologically ignorant. I, I did everything I could to try to learn as much as I could. I And I'm, I'm not going to tell you know the entire history. But when I became a Christian, one of those things that you do when you become a Christian, at least back then, it may not be so prevalent today, but back then, like, I'm a Christian. All right, I need to learn about Christianity. I need to read some books about Christianity. Like, if you learn, you read books. That's I mean, to me, that's a logical way it works. If you want to learn, you got to read something, right? So, and Christianity is a religion where we have a book called the Bible, and I need to know, I need to understand the Bible. So, I hopped in a car and went to the Christian bookstore. Christian bookstore in Abilene, Texas, located on Butternut Street. It's no longer there. I don't know what it is now. I think they built, it's turned into something else. I, don't, I haven't been by there in a long time. But I spent a lot of my uh, teenage years in that bookstore. And I walked in. Now, the good news is the older gentleman there, I told him I was a new Christian. He handed me, uh, you know, um, a wonderful book by James Montgomery Boyce, who was the pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church. Um, I think Foundations of the Christian Faith, I think it's what it was called, um, and a, you know, systematic theology. And so that was, that was wonderful. That was, God, you know, I, I thank God for his providence in there, saving me from all the garbage, heresy, and trash that is sold in Christian bookstores. So I'm grateful for that man. Um, but in that Christian bookstore, there was also, and there's no other way to get around it. I, I, I didn't call it this then, but later on in my Christianity, I began to realize what was happening. Um, in that Christian bookstore, there was a lot of Jesus junk, just a lot of junk. Throw the name of Jesus, throw the Bible verse on any object, on anything and sell it. Let's make some money. Let's sell the, every trinket, everything that we can think of, every kind of cheesy piece of junk that you could. It was in the Christian bookstore. And of course, they had t-shirts. Now, I'm a, I'm a teenager, right? T-shirts. Now, when, before I became saved, man, you know, I had my t-shirts representing because music was, you know, still to this day, music is a major part of my life, but music was, was my God. You know, there's no question about it. Even after my salvation, I have struggled to keep music in its rightful place. So wearing shirts representing my favorite bands from The Clash, The Dead Kennedys, all kinds of punk bands, you know, metal from Maiden to to to, to Sabbath, you, I go on and on, Floyd, on and 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 on. We could go all day. Um, I, I wore a lot of a lot of shirts representing my favorite bands. Now that I, that became a source of great frustration with me because there were a lot of people wearing shirts of bands who they didn't they couldn't even tell you their first album or I don't even know why they're wearing a band shirt when they can't even tell you anything about them. But that's a whole different story. Um, so when I walked into a Christian bookstore and saw that they had shirts, I'm like, okay, I'm a Christian now. I gotta I gotta represent Christianity. Wonderful. And I think there was a shirt there. At that time, you were talking the 80s, there was a, a beer commercial at this time. I think that there was something like, this buds for you, or something along those lines. And they had a shirt, instead of saying, this buds for you, this blood's for you. This blood's for you. And then it had a picture of Jesus, uh, like supposed to be the hand of Jesus with the nail through it, bleeding. And it said, this blood's for you. And then they had a Bible verse under it, something like, you know, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins, something along those lines. And I bought it. And I was like, yes, I'm going to represent that. Hey, you know what people need? They don't need beer. They need Jesus. They need this. And I wore that short shirt a lot for a, a long time until some point a Christian, it may have been a pastor, I can't remember, someone challenged me on it. Like, do you think likening the blood of Jesus? I mean, they're borrowing from a beer commercial. You're likening the blood of Jesus to beer. It just seems sacrilegious. It seems like you're, you know, you're demeaning the blood of Christ. You're, you're, you're trying to turn it into a, a sales gimmick. It just seems cheap and it's blasphemous. And I didn't think about it, but over time I began to realize, well, wait a minute, maybe I should, maybe I should check myself. Maybe I should question this. And I began to raise the question of, wait a minute, as Christians, 
What should we do when it comes to trying to reach the world? Now, at that time, um, you know, I, again, I became a Christian. I was told almost instantaneous during the 80s, you know, it was like a war on rock music around here in West Texas. You know, watch Footloose. They had nothing on what was going on here in West Texas. Um, it was, it was. in fact, I think Footloose was based on uh, a, a town here in Texas. So, I mean, it, it was crazy. And so I was told, all secular music, bad, evil, of Satan, run from it. But what I needed to do was listen to Christian music. And what I w- was told is, hey, whatever music you like in the world, there's a Christian version. And I was told it's an alternative instead of a, you know, being told it was a cheap ripoff of lesser quality, um, you know, you know, don't even get me started. I mean, how are you going to to try to compare Christian bands to Sabbath, Zeppelin, Maiden, Floyd? You know, come, uh, you know, come on. I mean, I mean, Rush. I mean, give me a break. I mean, um, you can try to pretend all day, but I mean, they don't have the they didn't have the same quality. It wasn't the same quality. It was cheap copies. Basically, the Christian music world was putting their finger in the air, going, "Which way is the musical wind blowing?" And say, "Okay, we need three bands to sound like this." And then you would go into a Christian bookstore, and they'd have a little chart. If you're a fan of this secular band, you need to listen to this Christian band, right? And it was a, it was the idea that hey, you need we need a version of it. Like we, we're going to reach the world, and the way we reach the world is we use their music. We're not going to be original and come up with our own our own style and push genres and try to develop and create. No, we're just going to simply copy the music of the world, but throw in some Jesus, you know, throw in some lyrics about Jesus. And that's the way we're going to reach the world. So you already kind of see what was happening. There was this like, hey, the world's doing it. Let's use it. Hey, they got a beer commercial. This buds for you. Let's use it. Hey, they've got this band is popular. Hey, let's make a Christian band that sounds like them. They dress this way. Let's dress this way. They do this. Let's do this. Let's try to be a, a, and it's like, we're going to copy the world at every step of the way. Now we're going to copy the world in order to try to reach the world. We're going to try to reach the world with poor copies or poor ripoffs of what the world is doing. And, and you have to you have to stop and start asking yourself, why? Why were we doing it that way? What, what was motivating us? Now, the, the ultimate motivation was good. The ultimate motivation was to try to r- win the world, but we never stopped to think about, is this the biblical model? And the biblical model clearly is not that. We were not to copy the world. We are to proclaim the truth to the world. There's nowhere where we're trying to copy their techniques and their methods. We are preaching the truth. We are preaching that they are in sin. They are sinners. All of us are under sin. And the only hope of salvation is in Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity who took upon human flesh, who came, suffered, died, buried, rose again on the third day, coming, ascended to the right hand of the Father, coming to judge the living and the dead. We are to proclaim the truth to them. Not trying to use every cheesy gimmick. And it's easy when you're a young Christian to get caught up into it. But at some point, theological growth and spiritual maturity should make you go, wait a minute, that's just so so cheap. It's so cheesy. It's so foolish. I mean, think about it. You you got a shirt, a Reese's, a Reese's Jesus shirt, a Reese's peanut butter cup Jesus shirt. I mean, really? That's no, 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 no. But the church does this in countless ways. I, where I live, not far from my house, there was a church this year. The greatest showman, the greatest showman. That was the big thing, the cultural thing, the greatest showman. So what did the church do? They had a greatest showman, you know, sermon series. And they they did all this stuff. I think they had a, a you know, like a big top tent and and they had this slickly made video and they were going to use music from the greatest showman. And, you know, the, the praise band was going to perform music from the greatest showman. And you could come to church and hear music from the greatest showman and hear a sermon. And when I saw that, I'm like, I wonder how many lost people look at that and go, oh, I'm going to go to church because I want to hear a church do a karaoke version of the greatest showman soundtrack. I mean, really? Or, or is it simply, well, hang on. So we'll, we'll get to, to another I'm going to take this to another level here in a minute. But it just, I think the world shakes their head at that. Go, what is that church doing? That's not church. What is that? 
it's 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 a gimmick it's a game it's 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 copying it's it cheapens what we're supposed to be about listen here here's my 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 premise here what you use to win them is what you win them to now i did not come up with this concept this has been talked about by many but what you use to win people is what you win them to you're not winning them to spirituality you're not winning them to Christianity, to Christ, to a world that says take uh, to to a, a religion that says take up your cross, die to yourself, uh, a, a religion that calls you not to love the world, not to be uh, friends with the world, to set your affections on things above. No, 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 no. You're using every worldly gimmick and idea and fad that you can to win people to, and all you're winning them to is worldliness. You're not, you're you're not really winning them to anything truly spiritual. And I think I think it ultimately hurts Christianity and cheapens Christianity. And and here's what I'm I'm going and I'm here I'm going to advance this even further. So I think it's cheap. I think it's foolish. I think it I think it's just and and there's a history of the church doing this. There's a history of the church doing this. We use every little technique back in um the 1990s when um. There was all kinds of new methods coming out in the business world, right? All these new methods about how to do business, um, how to, to to build your business, and and and, and you got to have a mission statement. You got to do this. You got to do that. The church came right along and took every technique being created in the business world, every idea, mission statement, need this, need that, and we took those concepts and brought them right into the church. We copied the world's techniques to build business, to build a church. Well, the my Bible says we don't build the church. Jesus says he will build his church. I'm called to equip saints. I'm called to teach the truth. I'm not called to entertain people. In fact, nowhere in the Bible are we called to entertain saints. We're called to equip them. And we're definitely not called to entertain lost people. We're called to feed sheep. We're not called to entertain goats. That's the Bible. There's no way to get around that. But many Christians are like, no, no, do whatever you want. Any means necessary. It's all good. Well, the motive may be right, but is the method right? I think this this has been an ongoing problem. All the church growth techniques, they they, they try to do the work. And this, and this is and this is where I was going to advance the conversation. I'll advance it this way. I think this is what happens. We come up with all these cheesy ideas, all these cheesy gimmicks, copy this, copy this, you know, do this, do that, and try to be relevant, try to be cool, try to be hip. And I think all we really do is I think for the most part, the world sits, I, I can remember plenty times at work listening to lost people say, I went to this church and it felt like a rock concert and it was just, just felt dumb. I mean, it didn't feel like church and that's lost people. I think this is what we ultimately do. There's a lot of professing Christians who don't really want historical, biblical, theological-based Christianity. They don't want to take up your cross, die to yourself, study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth, being equipped as a newborn babe, sincerely desire the, the milk of God's word, meditate on God's word day and night, this this learn the truth, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, study the Bible, study theology, know the history of their faith. They don't want any of that. They want something that more reflects a fun, uh, you know, social club. And there's plenty of churches out there who say, hey, we know that you, you know, you live in the world and you like this and you like that and you like that. So we're going to bring all of this into the world or we're going to bring all the world into the church and we're going to use it. And they, they tell themselves that what they're trying to do is attract the lost. But I think all they're really doing is attracting those Christians who don't really want historical, theological, Bible-based Christianity. They want a place to be entertained. They want a place filled with activities and 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 go from this and this and and oh that's cool. They use they you know they look at the sermon series that relates to you know, the greatest showman and they show movie clips and oh look that's cool and it's cool and it's fun and it's relevant and it's hip and it's and it's and and it and you know we're not gonna get too deep. We're not gonna get too theological. We're just gonna make it light. It's it's Jesus light. 
right? Jesus light, third less doctrine, third less conviction, third less theology, less everything. And I think that that's they just want to they want a little bit of Jesus, but they want a, they want a whole lot of the world. And what you do is you build big churches attracting fleshly people who don't really want anything that significant about their Christianity. And we use all of these worldly techniques, fleshly techniques, saying we're going to go out there and reach the lost. But I think all we ultimately do is attract fleshly, worldly, carnal Christians. And everybody is talking, you know, has been talking for a long time that Christianity has become so carnal, so, so worldly, so fleshly, that we're, that we're not really different than the world. And we've got a major problem and the church needs a revival and Christians need to wake up. Well, I'm sorry. We created the problem. We were out there convincing ourselves we're winning the loss. And all we were doing is building big big mega churches filled with worldly fleshly people. I'm not saying in every situation that's what happens. I'm saying that there is clearly a problem within Christianity. Everyone admits there's a problem, but no one wants to ever acknowledge how it happened. How it happened is we built a world, a, a Christian industry based on ripping off the world, copying of the world, and using every fleshly, cheesy idea that we can come up with instead of getting back to scripture, getting back to doctrine, theology, learning the history of the faith which we p- p- profess. We threw all of that out and we said, hey world, tell us what we are supposed to use. Okay, what's popular right now? Okay, oh, that's popular. Let's use it. Bring in the copiers. Let's copy this. Let's mimic this. Let's put some cheap copy up out there. This will attract people. No, it attracts worldly Christians who don't want anything significant in their spiritual life. They want fun, food, and activity, and the church is willing to give it to them. I think the the Reese's shirt is just, I mean, it, it, there's nothing new about that shirt. That's, that, that, that shirt and those kinds of shirts have been around since the 80s, probably even in the 70s. I bet you even go back to the 60s, late 60s, especially with the Jesus movement and the Jesus people. You go back to the Jesus movement, Jesus people, that's where you get the birth of contemporary Christian music. And that whole movement came out of the hippie movement and, and, and these people who are becoming Christians. But guess what they did not want? They loved Jesus. They didn't like the church. They didn't want the church. They didn't like that. They wanted something different. So you almost created a parachurch Christianity, a a, a Christianity that was outside of the church. They didn't want to submit. They didn't want to do any of that. They wanted their own version. And then you create an entire industry around it. And then, well, you see what happens when industry gets around it. I think I think there's there, there were, we were on to some serious problems within Christianity. Uh, something to really, 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 really think about. Now, I'll end with this. Just, just I'm just throwing out some thoughts about this, all from this this shirt. The same thing has happened with Christmas. Christmas, at some point in church history, was to be a time of celebration about the birth of Christ, the incarnation. You can go back, you can go through church history, you had a season of Advent, you had four weeks, um, and many, and, and, and it was a, a re- considered a time of repentance. Um, and you, 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 certain things couldn't be done during that period of time. There couldn't be marriages or other things that could not be done. There was a time of fasting, a time of repentance, remembering that Jesus Christ came to die for our sins. We weren't want to repent of those sins. It was structured in a very, you know, godly, scriptural, you know, committed way, being about Christ. It wasn't about, you know, there wasn't all this other stuff. And then obviously the world, um, as the world started bringing in this Christmas idea, they liked this idea. The world started catching on. And as the world started catching on, wait, the, the Christmas, uh, giving gifts, and then this whole Santa Claus thing, and you see how this all began to develop, especially in modern culture. And then at some point, society realized, wait a minute, a holiday about gift giving. This could be great for the economy. And so then, then Christmas started taking on a new image, right? 
It was about family and gifts and emotions and feelings, a magical time of the year, and all this, this heartwarming childhood memories of waking up with a Christmas tree and running down and seeing the presents and, and, G, and uh, Santa and all these other things. And, 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 and the world embraced it and said, hey, we can turn this into a major marketing thing and we can make billions of dollars, which they have every year. Billions of dollars is spent. Movies are made, and all these movies tug at the heartstrings and emotions and, and lights and, and all of the things that Christmas and food and all the wonderful and all the things Christmas has become about. And at some point, it was declared a federal holiday. And once it was declared a federal holiday, well, then for all practical purposes, Christmas became a secular holiday. And the church, in many cases, has tried to to capture or copy some of the way the world views Christmas to try to capture that same idea and that same spirit. Well, Christmas is never supposed to be able to capture the Christian idea of Christmas is not to capture the world's version. The world's version is separate from Jesus. We are supposed to simply be celebrating the incarnation of Jesus. That's what we're supposed to be celebrating. And, and the gift that we have received, and that gift is the incarnate Son of God who came to die for our sins. That's the gift. But we got swept up in all of this other stuff. Now, once it turned into a federal holiday, schools out, you know, businesses closed, it, it became a monster that for Christians, I mean, the, it become, Christmas becoming a federal holiday is the worst thing that could have ever happened because now we're left going, well, wait a minute, what do we do with this? And, and you don't have any good options. Right, especially as a family, you don't really have any good options. And I know there'll be some young couple going, "No, we've got it figured out." Just be humble. Don't think you have it figured out because when you're 18, the way you think you've got it figured out, you're going to find out that your kids resented you for it and hated you for everything you tried to do. So just just be wait before you start bragging about how much you've got it figured out. But for Chris, for Christians, we're kind of trapped in the middle of it. But the church. Hey, this is the way the wind's going, so we're going to follow along. So what do churches do? What do churches do? They do wonderful things like, wait a minute, Christmas is going to follow fall on a Sunday or a Wednesday? Cancel cancel church! Cancel church! Now, we may have a, 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 you know, a special service, you know, a, a Christmas Eve candlelight vigil kind of thing, but we're going to make sure we still cancel services because nothing celebrates the birth of Christ like canceling, like the church, which is supposed to be the bride of Christ, we're supposed to be about Christ. Nothing says, hey, Merry Christmas, like shutting everything down. Why? Because we're following a worldly concept, a worldly idea. The world, that's, I mean, if, if, if I've seen churches cancel services if, if, sun, if, if Christmas falls on a Sunday, oh, no, not doing that. And even if it doesn't fall on a Sunday, even if it doesn't fall on a Sunday, they will rearrange the entire, hey, here's our Christmas schedule for church. We're going to cancel this service and cancel this service. Why are you canceling services if we're going to say tell everyone Christmas is about Jesus? We're not making it about Jesus. We're making it about us. Why pretend? Just say, hey, Christmas is not about Jesus. We don't care. It's about us. And we're going to celebrate us. What we want, family, food, activities, and gifts. That's what it's about. And I, and I get sick and tired of Christians canceling services, making it about us, and then getting mad that the world won't say Merry Christmas. Get over it. It's not their job. It's your job. It's my job. But we, we constantly find our... Here's, here's what it comes down to. The world constantly influences Christianity. Now, the way it's supposed to work, we're supposed to be the influencers. We're supposed to be influencing the culture. We're supposed to be salt. We're supposed to be light. But over and over and over and over, we find ourselves being influenced. And we are influenced a million different ways when it comes to Christmas, when it comes to cheesy t-shirts, when it comes to music, when it comes to so much. We, The church falls for it every single time. We've got a history of falling for it. How do you get back to just being a church? Just being a church. Just, just do what a church is supposed to do. Teach the word of God. Proclaim the truth. Equip saints. End a story. But no, 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 no. If you try to do that, you're the wrong. Now, here's what's weird. In modern day Christianity, if you just try to be the church the way the church was designed to be, 
I mean, you look at the New Testament. The church is not does not. I mean, it's just told to preach the truth, equip saints. I mean, they're, they're very you know uh, partake of the Lord's Supper, baptize. I mean, there's uh, prayer. There, there's very few things we're called to do. And we're not even told specifically how to carry all of those uh, situations out with any, we're not given a, a specific instruction on, on some of those things. Now, church history, liturgies developed, and we could go look at those ancient liturgies, but many uh, in the Protestant world, we threw out those liturgies. So we're really, if we're going to go with the Bible, we don't have a lot to go, to go by. We know that in Corinth, they added a, a meal, a meal uh, to the Lord's Supper. They wanted to get together for a meal, and Paul told them, don't you have houses to eat in? Get that out of the church. Get it out of the church. Well, churches will still use all of that because we want we want to turn the church into something else. And when you try to say, let's get back to the, the church getting back to being what it is, then you're told, nope, you're doing church wrong. You're doing church wrong. You're doing church wrong. You're doing church wrong. Well, I'm like, well, nobody would have thought I was doing church wrong until modern day Christianity decided to copy every little cheesy gimmick in the world and turn the church into a social club. They're like, yes, but look at the numbers. Well, uh, numbers now determine if we're right or if we're wrong. I mean, you know, um, I guess we should be Catholic with what, 1.2 billion people claiming to be Catholic? Maybe we should, oh, no, no, we can't be Catholic. Maybe we should be Muslims. Oh, no, 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 no. So does, does numbers determine right or does numbers determine wrong? Maybe we should just get back to being the church, being the church, and not trying to copy everything the world does. All right, I'll stop right there. That concludes this very impromptu live broadcast on this Christmas day, sharing some feelings that were sparked by seeing a shirt at an NBA game that, that was supposed to look like a Reese's peanut butter cup, but it was really a Jesus shirt because he's our sweet savior. Get it? Sweet. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of sad. I've fallen for it. You've fallen for it. And if you look at American Christianity, we've all fallen for it. There's got to be a better way. All right, I'll stop right there. Um, I have church this evening at Victory Baptist Church. It is Wednesday, so guess what? We're going to have Wednesday church service because we don't cancel a Wednesday church service for the birth of Christ, do we? No, we go to church to remember the birth of Christ. So that's what we're going to do. And, uh, well, just pray that we have a good service and that it's a good time of remembering that Jesus came to die for us. All right, God bless. Have a great evening.